Uh, have you ever been in a position where the task was overwhelming? Have you ever been in a position where you were facing something and you thought it was absolutely insurmountable? You had absolutely no idea how you were going to get through it. Uh, you had no idea how you were going to be successful. Uh, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, that was me in the fall of 1989. I had this aha moment uh, while I was a political science major at SIU Edwardsville. I was getting ready to take the LSAT, that's the law school admission test. And I was asked to preach on a Sunday night in a church in Bethalto. And as I got up there to preach, the Spirit of God just fell on me and absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. I knew at that moment, at that second, that the Lord was calling me to preach. So I did. I began to preach. I began to put my name out there and tell people I was available to fill in at a church if a pastor was gone. And there was a pastor in Madison, Illinois. Anybody been to Madison, Illinois? <laughs> there was a church, a little bitty church, Temple Baptist Church in Madison, Illinois. And the guy was a reservist and he was gone once a month. And so he asked me if I would come down and preach. And so Jill and I lived in Glen Carbon, and we were going to school at SIU Edwardsville, and we were driving that Sunday morning through the city of Granite City. Anybody here been to Granite City? We were driving through Granite City on our way to Madison, and all of a sudden Jill says, I don't know why anybody lives in Granite City. I would never live in Granite City. And I said, Jill, don't say that. You know, you know what they say, right? I said, Jill, don't say that. And she says, no, I don't care. I know that I'll never live in Granite City. Well, you know where we lived within two months of her saying that? Granite City. So every night I have Jill say, I would never live in Hawaii. I would never be a missionary in Hawaii. I've been having her say that for 30 years, but it doesn't work, right? So this church in Granite City called me to be their pastor. You know, when I accepted that call to be a pastor, when I knew that God was calling me to do it, in my mind, I was thinking about the traditional path. I'm going to finish SIUE. I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to be trained. I'm going to learn. And then I'm going to graduate from seminary. Then I'm going to go pastor a church. But God had absolutely different ideas. He turned everything upside down. And there I was without really experience, without theological education, found myself as the pastor of First Baptist Church of Granite City. And it was overwhelming. I had an overwhelming burden. I had this strong sense that I knew that this is what God wanted me to do, but I also had this strong, overwhelming burden that I didn't know how I was going to be able to accomplish that. And I cannot remember where I came across this passage that we're going to be looking at today. I don't know if I heard another pastor preaching about it. I don't know if I heard somebody on the radio. I don't know if it was just me through the reading. I don't know how I stumbled upon this, but at that time, the Lord gave me this verse and it has been what I would call my life verse. In the front of every single one of my Bibles, I just put Z46 to remind me that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. We don't have any these little Zerubbabels running around here, do we? Maybe this after this sermon we'll have one, right? Zerubbabel, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord spoke to me through this passage so many years ago, and he was trying to affirm to me that the Lord's work does not depend upon my strength, it doesn't depend upon my ability, it doesn't depend upon, depend upon my power, my force, my talent, my skill, although we know he uses skillful, powerful, talented, wonderful people, right? But the work of the Lord is primarily not dependent upon those earthly things. The Lord accomplishes his great works by his spirit. He always has, and he always will. And that's freeing. That should be freeing to you. It's freeing to me because it's not about me. It's about Jesus in me. Why don't you say that with me? It's not about me it's about Jesus in me. So let's read the whole passage, and then I want to show you some principles that are in it. So it's Zechariah chapter 4. I'm not going to put it on the screen, the whole thing. So you can open up your Bibles, pull up your phone app, and let's go to Zechariah chapter 4. The angel who talked with me came again and woke me, talking about the prophet Zechariah. He woke me like a man who has wakened up out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, and the other on its left. 
And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then you, uh, then you not, do you not know what these are? He's, I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the high priest. Zerubbabel is the one that was put in charge of rebuilding the temple. The temple had been destroyed. And Zerubbabel was the priest that was in charge of rebuilding this massive undertaking. But this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These Seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless the reading of your word today. And Lord, we all humble ourselves before the authority of your word that never passes away. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that you'll speak to us by your spirit through this passage. Lord, I pray for everybody that's here today that you will accomplish in their hearts what you want to accomplish today. Lord, give them eyes to see, give them ears to hear, uh, not, not necessarily from me, but from you, Lord. May your spirit... Speak to your people today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a powerful vision. The book of Zechariah is a series of visions over and over and over. Zechariah is reporting to us the visions that he had during this time period. The people of God had been taken captive, and now they were released from Babylon. They're coming back to the city. Nehemiah came back after he had such a burden in his heart for the city. Nehemiah came back and oversaw one of the most wonderful projects in the history of humanity, rebuilding all the walls in just such a very, very short time. But the temple had not been rebuilt. And there were many, many, many enemies surrounding them that did not want that temple to be finished, did not want it to be built. And Zerubbabel was the one who was in charge of rebuilding this temple. And in the midst of all the strife, all the confusion, I mean, there's political confusion. There are people sending letters to the emperors, telling them that the Jews were about ready to revolt, trying to stir up all the trouble they could to stop the people of Israel from going back, establishing Jerusalem, reestablishing their country. There were so many obstacles from within the community of the Jews and without Uh, uh, on the outside of the community of the Jews. But in the midst of this all, Zechariah is telling us how God is working behind all the scenes. And in particular, this particular vision was a vision to the prophet Zechariah to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, you're going to finish it. Now let me just share with you some principles that I see in this passage. I hope they're a blessing to you. Here's the first principle. I call it the principle of the calling. The principle of the calling. Look at verse 9. This is the Lord saying this. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. This is God. The Lord chose Zerubbabel for this work, to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, a daunting task. But God wanted it done. And here's what God's saying. Zerubbabel has laid the foundation. Zerubbabel is going to finish it. I think it's very, very important for you to have a calling in your heart. I think it's important whether you're a pastor or whether you're not, it doesn't matter. No matter where you're at in life, I think it's very important for you to have a sense, especially as a Christian, you need to have a sense that I am where God wants me to be. Because sometimes there's good days and sometimes there's bad days. You know that, right? There are some days, you know, that that everything's awesome and you're like, man, this is the greatest job I've ever had in my entire life. I'm going to do this forever. And then there's some days you wake up and go, oh, my gosh, maybe the Lord was moving me on. 
Maybe I need to start praying about going somewhere else. If you don't have the foundation of your life being a calling, a deep sense of I am where I know that God wants me to do, I'm, I'm at this job because I know that God opened this door for me to have this job, then what happens is we are tossed by the waves. Man, I hate this job. I love this job. Maybe I should find another job. Maybe this is not God's will for me. Maybe this is God's will for me. All of that wavering back and forth, that lack of confidence comes from a sense that you don't know this is where God wants you to be. What God starts, God finishes. He says, Rebel, his hands are going to complete it. I want you to know whether you're a preacher or a pipe fitter. I say pipe fitter because there used to be a golf course on the north side of St. Louis called the Pipe Fitters Course. Anybody know that? The zoo bought the whole thing. Whether you're, a, whether you're a preacher or a pipe fitter, you should have a sense of calling. Whether you're a missionary or a model, I'm kind of joking now, <laughs> you know, preachers with alliteration, right? But you get my point. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a landscaper, I don't care what it is, you're there because you know that God wants you to be there. I remember when I was at SIU Edwardsville, I had one of those terrible jobs you could ever have. I worked for a place everybody called the Bargain Barn. And one night, somebody stole money out of the cash register, and they came straight to me. I don't know why. They came straight to me and, and, and a couple other employees that worked that, that place that night. And they said, you know, the police want to talk to you. The highway patrol wants to talk to you down in Collinsville. You guys need to go down there. So we go down there. They plug us up on these lie detector tests, and they start asking us, do you know who stole the money? Do you know where the money went? You know, were you a part of stealing the money? I go in there and answer all these questions, and then when we get done, a guy comes back in, and this is the reason why you should never ever take a polygraph test, because it's junk, it's garbage. I answered all these questions, the guy comes back in, he says, okay, where's the money? I'm like, what do you mean, where's the money? He said, you failed the test, these questions, and he lists these questions, you know, do you know where the money is? Do you have any uh, understanding where the money is? I'm like, no, no, and he said, I failed the test. He's like, you know, we can get a subpoena and look at your bank account. I said, please do, and if you find any money, praise the Lord. You know, I'm poor. You know what I mean? I am just got out of the army. I've got two daughters, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get through this. Trust me, folks, I did not steal any money from the bargain barn, okay? But they wouldn't fire me. They wouldn't fire me, and I had to have the job, and I'm still working day in, day out. It was, it was, it was a terrible situation. Um, it, was, it, was very, it was very uncomfortable being in that, in that whole setting with all that stuff going around. And one day, I'm running through the halls of SIUE because I was trying to get to class early. I've always wanted to be on time. So I was running to class, and uh, I passed by this booth out of the corner of my eye, and I went up the stairs, and all of a sudden, something in my mind was like, you need to go back. You need to go back down there and see what that is. You need to go back down there. So I went back down the stairs, and there was a table, and in front of it, it had a big UPS banner. And they were looking for people that was going to work, that could work there. So I went over there and signed my name on that UPS thing, went up to my class. The class got over, came down. That table was gone. It was absolutely gone. And I'd never seen UPS there even after that, the next couple of years. I got a call that week, got hired that week, and I, had, I then worked for UPS for, for three-plus years. I want you to know, I had a sense that God wanted me to have that job, that God gave me that job that God opened the door for me to work at UPS, to escape this place and go to this place. Do you know that where you're at, you're there because God placed you there, because God opened the door for you, because God's put it in your heart to be there? That is important. That's the principle of the calling. Ultimately, every single one of us as Christians, we work for God. No matter who signs the paycheck, we work for the Lord. Look at Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Every one of us, no matter where you're at, ultimately, you work for the Lord. There are times in my life I was I was, knew that I was exactly where the Father wanted me to be, even though I wasn't in ministry per se, Right? whether I was in the army, whether I was working for UPS, whether I was preaching. I worked for UPS twice. I want you to know anybody that has worked in the back of a truck at midnight, once you leave that place, you think, I will never, ever go back there again. But God's got ways of turning things upside down, right? All through my bachelor's degree, I worked at UPS, and then I pastored for five years, and then I went back to seminary in North Carolina, 
and I didn't know how I was going to make money, so you know what I did? I went down to UPS, and I want you to know that first night when I was back in that truck, after five years of not being in that truck, it was like deja vu. Oh my gosh, Lord, I thought I would never be doing this ever again, and here I am. But the Lord has a work for every single one of us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2.10. We, you, are his workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has a plan for every single one of you to get glory out of where you're at. Now, here's the truth for Christians. Here's the truth for Christians. There is always work in the work. For you as Christians, there's always work in the work. You know what I mean by that? Even though you might be working where you're at, God's got work for you in the work. You might think, oh my goodness, why has God got me in this place? He might have a mission for you to be in that place. There might be a soul that he wants you to touch. There might be somebody he wants you to encourage. There might be a relationship that he wants you to have so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. No matter where you're at, there is work in the work, right? There is work in the work, no matter where you're at, if you're a child of God. So there's the principle of the calling. Here's the second principle I want you to see. The second principle is the principle of beginnings. You know what I find? That people don't like beginnings. Anybody in here like that? We like arrivals. We want to get there, and we want to get there right now. I don't, want to have to, I don't want to have to go through those beginning times. I, would just, I just want to be a, be a rival, successful. I want to be there, and I want to get there fast. That's the way we are in America, right? We've got a culture that wants it, and whatever that is, is they want it right now, right? I get tickled every time I see that J.G. Wentworth commercial. Do you remember that? The people sticking their head out of the windows. I want my money, and I want it. Yeah, you guys have seen it too. That's the way sometimes people are in life. And look what the Lord says. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. You know, the temple that they finished, it wasn't as magnificent as David's uh, and Solomon's temple. The, the foundation, it wasn't the same as Solomon's temple. There was some animosity on the inside. Jews are like, wow, you know, look at that temple. And there are people that are upset about the beginnings of this work. And here's what God is saying. Some versions say it like this. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Everybody has to start somewhere. Everybody has to start somewhere. Don't worry about the future. Just be faithful where God has you right now. You've heard that saying, bloom where you're planted, right? There's a lot of truth to that. We need to focus on the now not yesterday, not tomorrow. God did some amazing things yesterday, right? It would have been awesome to be there and watch David kill Goliath, wouldn't it have been? It would have been awesome to see Jesus feed the 5,000. It would have been awesome to see so many different things throughout history. And we know in the future, God's got a plan. He's going to work. But guess what? We're living right now, today. This is God's now, today. And we need to be a part of God's now, not so focused on yesterday and not so yearning for the future that we are missing what the Lord might want to do right now in each of our lives. And so I love this. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Jesus taught this same thing. I think it also could be called not only the principle of beginnings, but it also could be called the law of responsibility. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells this story about about 10 servants and the master's leaving and he's going to leave his servants uh, the minuses so that they could invest them and do things with them. And when the servant, when the master comes back, he, he has a time where he's going to have a demanding, uh, an accountability for what they did with what the master gave them. And the one says, here's what you gave me. I've, I've got more. Another one, here's what you gave me. I've got more. And then the one guy finally comes up and says, listen, I was so afraid. I knew that you're such a taskmaster master, that I just made sure that I just kept what you gave me and didn't lose it. And you know what Jesus called that guy? A wicked, lazy servant. Now, this is the son of God. Every word he picks is a word that's important. And Jesus in the story says, the person who does nothing with what God gives them is wicked. 
Jesus said that, not me. He's wicked and he's lazy. We need to be faithful with, with what the Lord has given us, whether it's little or whether it's big. And Jesus at the very end says, the one who is faithful in the little, they'll get more. They will get more. I believe this. Jill and I have seen this play out in our lives all through our entire life. You know, when we graduate from seminary, when you leave seminary, you leave one of three ways. The first way you leave is in the back of a pickup truck. Your cousins come pick you up. Your dad comes pick you up. They load everything in the back of a pickup truck, right? The second way you leave is you leave with a U-Haul. Somebody got money to get a U-Haul and you load everything up in a U-Haul. But the third way you leave seminary is when the moving company comes and boxes everything up for you. You've hit, you've hit the big time, right? I mean, that's the three ways you moved out of seminary. And when it was time for Jill and I to leave, we didn't leave in the back of Jill's dad's pickup truck. We didn't leave in a U-Haul. Rock Hill Baptist Church right here sent a moving company and moved us here. We were so blessed to be at this church. And when that moving company backed up to the back of our house, and we just kind of stood there, you know, not having to pack or load or anything else. You know, everybody around the whole seminary village there, they're all looking at us. What is going? Where are you going? What church hired you? But I want you to know that that did not happen by accident. I believe in my heart that we were faithful and God blessed us. Every single Sunday we'd get in church, we'd get in our car and go to church. And I hate to say it, but there were a lot, a lot of people around us that were studying to be preachers that didn't even go to church on Sunday morning. Too busy studying, too busy doing this, too busy doing that. We would get up and we would go to church every Sunday morning. I was faithful to preach no matter where God called me to preach. One time we went to this little bitty old country church. There were like five people sitting in that church. We're sitting there. Not one single one of them even greeted us. We're just like, what's going on? And finally an old man over here said, are we going to sing something? And the other old man over here said, just let the preacher do what he came to do. So I did. I got up and did what I came to do. But that didn't dishearten me. I never thought that in my mind, whether I'm preaching to 5,000 people or five people, it makes no difference. This is what God's called me to do, and I'm going to be faithful to do it. We started serving in the church that God called us to serve in. And uh, Jill started working with the kids, and I started serving and working. And one day, the worship leader left the church, and they had nobody to lead the worship. And I went up to the pastor. I said, listen, you know what? I sang choirs in high school. If you can't get a worship leader and it's a Sunday you need me to fill in, I, I can lead the worship, okay? He called me on a Saturday night. He procrastinated, called me on a Saturday night and said, will you lead our worship tomorrow morning? And I'm like, yes, I will. So I got up with that little praise team and put together a worship service, and I led the worship in that church for almost a year, didn't I, before they called somebody? Yeah, me, worship leader. Don't get any ideas. It's not going to happen. Good Lord willing, right? And then one time the preacher got sick, and he asked me if I'd preach, and I got up and preached, and a lady came up to me afterwards and said, I know that you're a worship leader, but have you ever thought about being a preacher? I'm like, I'm trying to be a preacher. I'm just filling in because this is where the Lord needs me. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Be the best where you're at. And ultimately, the motivation to be the best where you're at is not your human boss. It's your heavenly father. Because you're working for him. That's who you're working for. You're not working for them. This is the principle of small beginnings. Or it could be the principle of the law of responsibility. You're responsible of a little. God opens doors and gives you more and more and more. Now, here's the third principle. It's the principle of the flow, okay? Zechariah had this unusual vision. The angel woke him up like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And you know what? It's kind of funny. That's why I'm preaching this passage here today. A couple of days ago, Richard Matua called me on the phone. Well, he didn't call me. He texted me on this little thing called WhatsApp. Uh, people all around the world use WhatsApp, and that's how I communicate with all these Africans. And he says, Dodd, I'm getting ready to go to devotion with the boys because he's taking care of the street boys that we've been rescuing off the streets in, in Katali, supporting his work. I'm getting ready to go to devotion with the boys. Give me something to share with them. 
And so I just kind of bowed my head and prayed. And the first thing that came to my mind was Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, by the Spirit, saith the Lord. Who are you, mountain? In the path of these boys? God's got a plan for you, boys. And this mountain is going to be made a plain for you. if You keep following the Lord. So I gave it to him. And he texted me back later, Dad, that's powerful, you know. And then the next day, Jill calls me from work. She's like, give me a scripture. Give me a scripture. I was like, Jill, Zechariah 4, 6. Not by power, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Who are you, mountain, in the path of Jill? You will be a plain. If God is blessing you, God is going to be with you. He's going to see you to the end. And so then, that night, I'm in the middle of my sleep, and in my dream, I'm at church just like this. And I'm sitting there, and there's a guest speaker. There's a guest speaker supposed to be here, and he didn't show up. So in my dream, they said, you're going to have to preach. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how can I preach? I don't have my notebook. I don't have my outline. I don't have anything. What am I going to do? And then all of a sudden, it came to my mind. Not my mind, my dream mind, okay? Preach Zechariah 4, 6, and then immediately I woke up wide awake. I mean, just immediately, just absolutely wide awake. And I thought, okay, that's what I'm preaching Sunday. I'm preaching Zechariah 4, 6. I find that God does that. God speaks to us sometimes in our dreams. I, I oftentimes even lay down and say, Lord Jesus, please speak to me tonight in my dreams. And this is biblical. You know this, don't you? Acts chapter 2, verse 17, when the Spirit of God fell on the people of God at Pentecost, this is what Peter said. This is being fulfilled before your eyes. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not just upon prophets, not just upon priests, not just upon kings. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I'm not an old man yet, but God's given me a blessing to dream dreams, right? All right, stop that. I got to be with Ron Parley for two weeks, so please pray extra for me, okay? Now nah, it's a blessing. So the Lord used to speak to prophets, priests, kings. Now he reveals himself to sons and daughters, young and old. Jesus tore the veil and made it possible for every single one of us to have a relationship with the Father. And that's what happened to Zechariah. I don't know if he had the vision after he woke up or before he woke up, but let's look at the vision. I went online just to see if somebody had, had artistically done something, and sure enough, they had. And this is what Zechariah saw. He saw a gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on the top. He saw seven lamps, fire coming out of each one of them, the fire representing the work of God, right? Right? And he saw seven channels continually supplying the seven lights on the stands. And there were two olive trees standing on each side of the lampstand with two gold pipes that continually supplied the golden oil to the bowl. The trees represent God's servants, and the oil is the Spirit of God. And you see that? From the tree, through the pipe, to the bowl, running out of the bowl, through those stems, into those fires, each one, a continual flow of God's Spirit to source the flame of God's purpose in your life and in my life. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So awesome things are going to happen in your life and my life as long as we stay connected. As long as we abide. It's interesting that's the principle of flow. And it's interesting that Jesus Christ said the exact same thing in John chapter 15. That very well-known passage, Jesus said the exact same thing. I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. You are the branches. Abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't stay connected to me, you will wither. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, says the sap flowing from the vine into the branches, which are you and I. We have to stay connected. So here's the principle of the flow. Man, if we just walk with Jesus every day, there will be a flow of the Spirit of God to fuel the fire of God's purpose in your life and in my life. It'll just happen naturally. It's a principle of the flow. Where are you, O great mountain? Where are you, obstacle, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. Isn't that great? Where are you, old mountain, 
in front of John, in front of Amy, in front of any one of us. Who are, who are you, old mountain? Before the flow of God's spirit, f- flaming the, f- fueling the fire of God's purpose in a life of rubble, in the life of you, me, you are nothing. That's the principle of the flow. The best for my life is to live out God's plan and God's vision for me. And when I find it, mountains are leveled, obstacles are removed, accomplishments happen for God and his glory. So the principle of the calling, there's work in the work, folks. Find it. And you can find joy in any job that you have. The principle of beginnings, it's law of responsibility. You want more, you want better, you want different, you want something else, here's where it starts. Just be faithful every day where you're at. The principle of the flow, stay connected. Stay connected. Abide in Jesus. Get in his word every single day. Let his word feed your heart. Audibly in the morning, Lord Jesus, I want to walk with you. I want, I want, Holy Spirit, do something in my life today. I, I, I want to see what you want to do in, in me. There's work in the work. Lord, what is it? What is it? What do you want me to do? I know I'm just here studying, but what is the work in the work with this? I know this is my job, but what is the work in the work, Lord, that you're attempting to do? Hmm. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Love that. Love that. Let's have our worship team come. Let's bow as we pray.